So we have one more week where uh, we've got to be on this hardwired mic. We had, we, we just have so much equ equipment failure here. And um, it's largely due to just old wiring and electricity that shorts everything out. But um, so one more week of being tethered. You should be thankful it's not Brian because being Italian, he needs four of his hands. <laughs> being a Jew, I just need one, you know. <laughs> Unless I say on one hand, but then I can do on the other hand, right? You know this, right? Yeah. So I've got some friends visiting today, uh, Doug and Debbie Bernie and Russ and Joy Carroll. These people go back, way back into my past when Andrea walked into a church 35 years ago or so in uh, Irvine, California. So if you want to know some dirty details about us that I haven't shared, it seems like I've shared enough, but these guys could fill in some blanks for you. We're, uh, we're continuing in the series that we started last week uh, on Easter called Teshuvah. And in ancient Hebrew, Teshuvah is the word that is often translated repentance, but it literally means to return. And it carries with it the idea of making a U-turn in our lives and then traveling down that well-worn path that countless others have used to return to God. The series is built on the premise that God is the author of life. He's the one that our hearts are built for and that we are never more fully alive than we, when we're in intimate relationship with him. And so even if we might be making teshuva, this return for the first time in our lives, it's as if we're returning to the original uh, path that God made for our souls. And in this teshuva series, we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at inspirational people in the Bible who made U-turns to travel down this well-worn path back to God. And it's interesting to point out that in modern Hebrew, the word teshuva means an answer. And I think that's really cool. Because whenever we have serious questions or struggles in our life, the answer is always to return to God down that well-worn path. And so Brian kicked off the series last week. We looked at the two disciples who had given up hope that Jesus was the Messiah after he was crucified on a cross by the Romans. They're leaving Jerusalem. They're on their way back to their hometown called Emmaus. And their world has been turned upside down. They're questioning everything they ever believed. They're walking away from God. But then they have this encounter with the risen Savior. Opens up their eyes to the truth. They immediately return back to Jerusalem. And more importantly, they return back to God. And so today we're going to look at the two criminals who were executed on either side of Jesus. And I'm calling this message Desperate Moments. And what we do in a desperate moment is often a matter of life and death that can have eternal repercussions. And these two criminals have very different responses in their desperate moment that leads down two very different, uh, has two different eternal uh, consequences. And so as part of my introduction to this message, I don't want to be outdone by Brian, who showed these ridiculously hilarious, weird bunny pictures from last week. Remember those? Who can forget that? You probably don't remember anything else he said, huh? But you remember those creepy bunny pictures. So I want to show you f a few pictures of people caught in very desperate moments just before something really bad is going to happen to them. And these are some people who are at a baseball game here. And look at that. They often have coroptophobia, which is the fear of bats. Because look at, let's just sheer tear. Look at the guy with the piece of gum in his mouth. He's going to choke to death. All right, here's a guy who thinks he's in total control. He's in denial. You never want to be in front of your bike when you're in the air. I like the guy in green with the green stripes. He's on the move. He's going to catch him. All right. This is the next episode of Goats Gone Wild. Why she has a goat in her bedroom, I have no idea. And then here's that moment when your world turns upside down. That's not going to go good, is it? No. I had to show one of those. Okay, and then here's a young man that turns to prayer. <laughs> this is every mother's nightmare, isn't it? My kids are out there. The logic brain hasn't kicked into gear yet. So we've all had a desperate moment or two in our lives, and if you haven't, you will eventually, okay? It could be from a failing marriage or a life-threatening illness or a sudden loss of a loved one or 
a financial crisis, loss of a job, or even getting in trouble uh, into legal problems. Desperate moments are definitely challenging moments in our lives, but they can be a teshuva opportunity as well. In other words, a desperate moment in our life can be an opportunity to make that U-turn and head down that well-worn path to God. Andrew and I found God during a desperate moment when our marriage was failing. And although I know that God can use anything, any situation to draw us to him, he often uses desperate moments to get our attention. How many of you found God during a desperate moment in your life? Hold your hand up and then turn around if you can't see. Hold them up high because it's just like this in every service. Almost 80, 90 percent of the people. So let's uh, read together the story of these two criminals from Luke chapter 23, verse 32 and 43. Let's stand up. Let's read it together. Let's, uh, let's get into the story together. And we'll read it out loud together. Here we go. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So, this is a really cool book. It's written by Colin Smith, and it's a beautiful historical fiction about the second criminal on the cross, and it's called Heaven, How I Got There. I want to read to you most of the first chapter of this book because it speculates on who this guy is and how he might have ended up being crucified that day by the Romans. The oppressive Romans used this public display of sheer brutality as a way of deterring its citizens from becoming revolutionaries, and it was highly effective, much in the same way that Groups like ISIS and other radicalized Islamic governments use public beheadings to deter its citizens. And so however you currently think of the Roman Empire, you should um, think of it as how they governed in a very highly oppressive and evil system. What I'm about to read you is written from the perspective of the second criminal, but it could easily be the same circumstance for the first criminal. And I'm reading this story to you in order to make their lives more personal for us. I want us to get into this story. I want you to see yourself in this story. These criminals had parents who loved them dearly. They had hopes and dreams, just like we all have hopes and dreams. They never envisioned their life ending on a Roman cross. And yet, doesn't life happen while we're making plans? Doesn't it turn out that way a lot of the time? So stay focused and try to visualize yourself somehow in this story, okay? I'm just going to read it from here so I don't have to put on glasses and look like I'm older than I really am. Okay. (laughs) Not many men open their eyes in the morning knowing it's their last day on earth. This is it. This is the day I die. Looking back on the entire day and how it ended still blows my mind. I awoke in the cell where they were holding me pending execution or to be more accurate, torture, humiliation, and a long, slow descent into death on a cross. Only the Romans could have perpetuated such barbarity, and I hated them with every fiber of my being. My story began in an ordinary home and is largely without surprise. My father made a modest living as a builder, while my mother, who, who set the pace for family, gave herself to setting her children on the right path. Because we were Jewish, the synagogue was a regular part of our family life, as was the annual trip to the temple in Jerusalem. 
My mother, a woman of ridiculous faith, made sure that I was well-schooled in the teachings of our fathers. God is gracious and compassionate, she said, slow to anger and abounding in love. She also taught us the Ten Commandments, and with them, a long list of rules drawn from the scriptures, the rabbis, and from her own uh, fund of wisdom. Her world was simple. There was a right way to live, and there was a wrong way. Live the right way, and all will end well. Live, live the wrong way, and y you had better watch out. God is watching you, she would say. He sees everything, and he never forgets. He remembers the good, and he remembers the evil. You will always reap what you sow. Her favorite book in the scriptures was the pr book of Proverbs. I can still hear her voice telling me that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Then she would ask me, do you fear God? It never occurred to me that there was any other option. Like most children, I pretty much just accepted what my mother taught me about God until my early teens when I began to have questions about God and about authority in general. A major turning point occurred for, for me at the age of 13 when I saw up close the injustice that was woven into the fabric of our national life. My father worked so hard to make ends meet for our family, but the intolerable taxes imposed on us by the occupying Romans Roman army made even more modest lifestyle hard to sustain. That particular day, the tax collector knocked on the door with his latest unfounded demand. I remember the, pain, the pained and the powerless look on my father's face. It was as if they had broken his back, crushed his spirit. Everyone knew that the system was riddled with corruption, but what can you do when the power of a brutal army stands behind the slimy little tax man? Seeing my father look that way made me furious. What right did these impostors have to march into our land and demand our money? Since when did we owe them? The whole thing was an injustice, and even as a young man, it made me mad. It simply wasn't fair. Our annual visit to the temple in Jerusalem had always been a highlight of my family life. Think of a vacation with your extended family, and you will get the idea. My first impression of the temple was of awe and wonder, the size of the building, the depth of the walls, the noise of the crowds, and the relentless activity in the temple courts took my breath away. But as the years passed, my questions began to grow. The priests offered a relentless diet of rules and morality, wisdom for life, they called it. But what were they, what were they doing about the glaring injustice that was plain for all to see in the ever-present oppression of Rome? Nothing, as far as I could see. Gradually, I came to the conclusion that the temple, the priests, and the whole moral structure was supremely irrelevant to the real issues of life for our people. Over time, the hatred I felt toward Rome showed up in a growing resentment toward the temple, its rules, and its God. It seemed like the priests and religious professionals were just playing games, while all the time they were ignoring the real issues that needed to be addressed in society. I watched how people poured money into the temple treasury and thought about how the money could be used to fund the small bands of freedom fighters who were ready to risk their lives in standing up to the Roman occupation. But that didn't happen. Instead, the money rolled into the temple coffers to be sunk into the endless maintenance of buildings and priests who, as far as I could see, had little to offer, rules, morality. Where was this getting us? What could it all accomplish? Somewhere in these anxious and angry thoughts, a rebellion was born in my heart. So you won't be surprised when I tell you that the temple was the scene of my first theft at the age of 15. Brings a bit of life to it, doesn't it? The story goes on to tell how this young man continues to steal and use money to fund the underground revolutionary uprising against the Roman occupation. He was Jewish. And he was part of the political zealot movement of that day, trying to overthrow the Roman government. You might recall one of the original 12 disciples is called Simon the Zealot of that particular political persuasion. Probably not a zealot that way anymore. His zeal probably got transferred to zeal of faith rather than a zeal of rebellion. Eventually, both of these criminals get arrested they're convicted, and they're sent to be crucified on a cross. They will be put to death in a brutal fashion for their subversive crimes against the state, but more importantly, to deter other Jews from joining in on the rebellion. And as fate would have it, as fate would have it, these two guys are crucified on either side of Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine playing that role in God's story? It's a brief cameo, but it immortalizes for generations to follow two very different desperate responses that each criminal has towards Jesus in their desperate moment. 
Let's first look at the desperate response of criminal, criminal number one. At first glance, it seems like he teams up with the soldiers to mock Jesus, and most translators seems to give this kind of a spin to their interpretation. But if you think about it, who in their right desperate moment mind, while being brutally tortured and facing imminent death, would identify themselves with the very people who are responsible for nailing him to that cross in the first place? And the clue to what is really going on is looking closer at the Greek word that's used to describe what the soldiers are saying to Jesus versus the Greek word that's used to describe what the criminal, criminal number one, is saying to Jesus. The Greek word that's used to describe what the soldiers are saying to Jesus is empaizo, and it means to speak in a very childish manner. Empaizo is a compound word. M means inside or metaphorically in the condition of, and paizo means a child, so in the condition of a child. So it describes metaphorically uh, to act in a very immature, teasing kind of a behavior like what you'd expect on a school playground. Your mama smells like my belly button. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, yeah, well, your mama wears combat boots. Ha, ha, ha. You all remember that, don't you? Yeah, you've done it. On the other hand, the Greek word that's used to describe what criminal number one is saying to Jesus is blasphemia. Sound familiar? That's where we get our English word blaspheme. And it means to speak irreverently about or to someone, which typically includes very foul, cursing, swearing kind of language. And so criminal number one isn't to teasing Jesus like a child, he's railing against him like a very angry adult. And I believe that there's a better than good chance that when the soldiers called Jesus God's Messiah, God's Savior, that this was the first time that this guy understood the identity of who was hanging right next to him. Oh, so this is that crazy rabbi everyone's been talking about. He's going to claiming that he's the Messiah. And so being more than just a little can I say it? Pissed off about his desperate situation, criminal number one begins to shout out colorful metaphors and demands to Jesus. And I'm going to speculate on what he said. I'll keep it PG, but think of it more as triple X, okay? Here's my spin on, on what I think he's saying to Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of Jesus, are you freaking kidding me? You're the Messiah, and you're hanging up here on this god awful cross what the fruit cake are we still up here for <laughs> if you're the messiah get us off this darn piece of wood right now in other words it's like he's saying prove to me that you're the messiah by solving my problem which is the deal that many of us try to make with god give me the power to support the way i want to live and then i'll believe in you heal me then i'll believe in you Save my marriage, then I'll believe in you. Get me a job, then I'll believe in you. Find me a soulmate, then I'll believe in you. Author Tim Keller calls this the problem-centered approach to knowing Jesus. And if you think about it, criminal number one's question is not really a question. It's a demand. It's a threat. I will believe in you when you give me what I want. Because the only way I can be happy, the only way I can be content, is if I get to live my life the way I best see fit to live it. Keller also says that if we first come to God with conditions, then we aren't really wanting to surrender our lives to Jesus or to become a person who lives like Jesus lived. On the contrary, our demands reveal that we already know what's best for our lives. And all we really want from Jesus is the power and support to live that way. And I know this subject is tricky because God cares about our needs. He cares about our struggles, wants us to cry out to him for help. But ultimately, our prayers need to be the same as Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was crucified. He knew what laid before him, and he cried out to God, Father, if it's at all possible, let's do this another way. I mean, I don't want to do this. This is too much to bear. You should never think it was easy for Jesus to get on that cross. He didn't want to do it. But he went on to say, but even so, even so, not my will, but yours be done. You know what's best, even, even when it doesn't feel right to me. 
Think of it this way. When John the Baptist was arrested and awaiting execution, he sent some messengers to, uh, to Jesus, and he asked him to ask him this question. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah, or should we expect someone else? I'm in jail. I don't know if you noticed. See, the wheels had come off in John's life. He was having a very desperate moment. But notice he doesn't say, spring me. Get me out of this mess. In his desperate moment, all John wants to know if Jesus is the real deal. Just tell me you are who you are. I can accept that. Because, listen, I think this is really important. John knows that whatever Jesus asks of him will be tiny compared to what Jesus will give to him. Whatever sacrifice is asked of John will be nothing compared to the glory that will be his for all of eternity. Most of the time, and I'm included in this, most of the time our prayers come from a temporal, earthly perspective rather than an eternal, heavenly perspective. In our most desperate moments, we want to desperately hang on to this life because we don't fully understand how glorious the next one will be. And so with only a few more desperate breaths of life left in him, criminal number one is desperate to hang on to his life. But what is striking to notice in this story is that Jesus says absolutely nothing to him in response to his demands. Nothing. He's silent. He's going to die. And he's going to die without faith, leaving his eternal destiny in question. Okay. On the other hand... (laughs) It's just if you're Jewish, it's just in your DNA. I have so many on the other hands in my messages. Criminal number two has a totally different desperate response. He saw how Jesus asked God to forgive his executioners. How can a man hanging on a cross be so gracious and merciful? I'm sure he's thinking that. He knows Jesus did nothing wrong to deserve death. And he knows that that's all the more convicting since he knows that he does deserve death. And I'm guessing it all just kind of clicked into place for him at that moment. In his desperate moment, he knows for sure who Jesus is. He's the Messiah that he's been claiming to be. And with only a few breaths remaining in his life, criminal number two cries out in faith, Jesus, remember me when you were in your kingdom. So I told you that Andrew and I found God when we were in our marriage crisis. Andrea first ended up going to this little church in Irvine, California called Voyages Bible Church. I followed along about six months later. I thought our biggest need was to fix our marriage. I'm sure Andrea did too. That wasn't our biggest need. Our biggest need was to find Jesus. Because everything we had tried wasn't working. We needed to first resolve where we were going to spend eternity and just take that entire pressure off of our life so that we could focus and allow Jesus to come in and heal us. You're going to hear a song in a little bit, and one of the verses in this song says that we let his blood bleed into our wounds. It sounds kind of gross, but it's beautiful. Tell you another story. We've had several people who have come to Cornerstone who said that they, while they were passing by our building or had some kind of experience, they heard God say, come here. Shelly, I think you had an experience like that, right? Shelly, I think, was trying to find Cornerstone, and she's, she, was, she saw our lighted sign uh, one night driving past it. The only trouble was we didn't have a lighted sign back then. Do, 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 After first service, I had this other lady came and said, do you guys advertise on the radio? She goes, no. She goes, well, my daughter told me about Cornerstone. She said she heard an advertisement. She's driving somewhere in the Midwest and some radio station advertised Cornerstone on Lashley Lane. I go, no, we don't advertise. Anyways, years ago, I'm guessing maybe... 15 years ago, 
uh, a woman named Barb who had worked for the Boulder, uh, Boulder Valley School District was driving by Cornerstone, her story, not my story, on her way to another church, I won't mention the church in town, that doesn't teach anything about personal need for salvation. She needed it desperately. And she heard God's voice say, go to that church. I mean, she said it was audible. It was so clear. She just came and was so inspired by the service that Sunday morning. She came Tuesday night, the following Tuesday night, to a healing prayer service that we had and shared a little bit of her story. She was fighting a very aggressive form of brain cancer and told her story. And I said, well, let's pray for you. And then as only a Southern Baptist Christian could do. Some visiting couple put their hand on my shoulder and said, well, Pastor Gene, don't you think you better tell her about Jesus? And I, so I did. I shared the gospel with her. And Barb prayed to receive Jesus as her Savior. She was dead in two months. Yeah, it seems tragic. She's not complaining. The whole thing is just absolutely beautifully miraculous, actually. Sure, God could have healed her. And she could have had, you know, 20, 30 more years of this. Or she can have an eternity of that. There was only one ticket to paradise given out on that day on the cross. Sorry, Eddie Money. He sings two tickets if you're old enough. I've got two tickets to paradise. Oh, look at that. I got a couple people. <laughs> Jesus was absolutely silent to the demands of criminal number one, but with only a few breaths in his life, Jesus finds the strength to say to criminal number two, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is a, a word borrowed from the Persian language. It literally means a walled-in garden. In other words, a garden with boundaries. Doesn't that describe what New Jerusalem is going to be like? Nothing evil can ever penetrate it again. There will be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more suffering and no more death. And so I don't know where, where you're all at. I know where some of you are at, but I don't know where you're all at, whether you have ever made a teshuva, a return to God, even if it's the first time, recognizing that God made you to be connected to him. Maybe today's that day for you. Or maybe you've made that return, but you've turned around again and want to turn back. A lot of us do that several times in our life. Today's a good day to make a U-turn. Or maybe you just want to celebrate the fact that God got your attention at some point in your life and you've been walking with him ever since. So I want to do that as we approach communion. We do this once a month. It's really uh, an observance to celebrate what Jesus did for us to provide a way back to him. This is the best way to describe teshuva right here. This is how we get back through the blood and the broken body of Jesus who did nothing wrong and yet took our sins upon him and paid the price that we should have paid. That's what that criminal number two. But I want to do something, what I think is pretty cool. I think it'll be inspiring for you. You have to first stand. Well, at first you have to trust me. Now you can stand. If you don't trust me, stay seated. Stay seated. I'll know. I want to play for you a video that's really, it's really just a song with the word, the lyrics to the song. It's called um, This Is How Love Wins by Stephen Curtis Chapman. It's not, it's, it's a fairly new song. It's only been out for a couple years or so, um, even though he's been around for a long time. And it's the story of the second criminal. And it has a lot of this kind of same thoughts of what um, I read in the book and what I've been sharing to you. And 
I'd like you to remain standing during the song. It's only I've only got three minutes of it. It's actually a six-minute song, but I've edited it down, and I put the words in it and put some scripture verses in there. And it does, it, you know, when you're reading the scripture verses, everybody comes up to me and says, is there something wrong with the video? It, it, it's intended to be cool, okay? This isn't a problem. It kind of jumps around a little bit. So when you see it, don't think that the computer's messing things up or think of it as cool, okay? Gene is so artistic. Look how cool that is. But here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read Galatians 2.20 together with you. I'd like to read it three times, including the two sentences that are at the bottom of the screen. And can we get the house lights kind of, yeah, get it to like very whitish? There we go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. I'm all about the mood. All right, I got I to gotta sober up here because this is it's supposed to be a really serious moment. I want you, you know, Jesus said that if you want to follow me, you need to take up your cross, then come follow me. You know, it's a metaphor to dying to yourself, to giving up yourself, to surrendering to God. Not your will, but God's will. And this verse in Galatians 2.20 picks up on that same thing. That actually, there's, a, there's in this metaphorical sense that we have actually been crucified with the Messiah. And it's us that no longer live, but it's the Messiah living in us now. That's what I was trying to, the point I was trying to make when Andrew and I found Jesus. We needed to get God in us so that he could bleed in our wounds. So, you don't have to do this, but I thought it would be interesting. Actually, this was Aaron's idea, so you can blame him if it doesn't work. Let's read the verse three times, including the sentences, and then I'm gonna, we're just going to start the video. And during this entire time, which is probably going to take about three and a half minutes, if you would, if you could just extend your hands out. If you want, just don't hit the people next to you. And actually kind of envision yourself crucified with the Messiah. I know it might be creepy and even, I don't know, offensive. But it's meant to be that way. The cross is very offensive. And just see if the Holy Spirit would do something. For those of you who are making teshuva for the first time, as you're going through this, just say, yes, I believe you're the Messiah. Thank you for dying for my sins. Coming back, same thing, thanking God that he grabbed your attention at some point in your life. And uh, we'll take, the ushers will come down and dismiss you after the video. And um, hold the elements. We'll take it together somewhere in the middle of this song. Okay, so let's do it together. I'm going to put this down because I want to be with you.
Life began like any other man Held beneath a mother's loving gaze Somewhere between now and then I lost the man I could have been deserves this cross a suffering that should belong to me and deep within this man I hang beside is the place where shame and grace collide and it's beautiful agony This is how love wins Every single time Climbing high upon a tree Where someone else should die This is how love heals The deepest part of you Letting himself bleed into The middle of your wounds This is what love says Standing at the door And you don't have to be Who you've been before Silenced by his voice Death can't speak again This is how love wins can wash away my sin nothing but the blood nothing but the blood what can make me whole again nothing but the blood nothing but the blood cause this is what love says standing at Death can't speak again This is how love